There it is. Howdy, my name is Tori Jackson, pronouns they, them. I'm the coordinator of the LGBT Q plus Pride Center in the Office of the Dean of Student Life here at Texas A&M University. I'd like to start off by thanking our panel for taking the time to talk about LGBTQ veterans, especially in this stressful and uncertain time. The Pride Center feels it's important to continue to educate about LGBTQ topics. In a minute, our panelists will introduce themselves. We have a selection of pre-prepared questions, and I want to encourage those on Facebook to comment your questions. I wanna ask for some grace from our viewers. This is the first time the center is putting on something like this online and there may be some bumps. And with that, um, I'd like to invite Captain Jonathan Roman to start us off with introductions. Hey, uh, good evening folks over at Texas a &M, um, and then to my panel mates, uh, wherever they may be. So I am Captain Jonathan Roman. Um, my career has been about nine years long thus far. Uh, the first six years I spent as an Army Reservist uh, signal officer, um, including two deployments, one overseas to Kuwait and then one stateside to Fort Bragg. Um, my last three-ish years, I've been serving as a cyberspace operations officer um, in the Air Force at Holloman Air Force Base in here in New Mexico. Um, and that includes one deployment to Qatar um, and I have already had my next assignment, which I'm so uh, excited to start doing. I'll be moving to Moody Air Force Base in Georgia to be the director of support for the Air Ground Ops Wing, which has a really exciting mission. Um, the highlights of my nine years um, includes working for the first uh, GO to be, sorry, the first officer to be promoted to GO that was out and open, um, Major General Tammy Smith. I got to be her aide de camp. Um, that, was, that was something. Uh, earning my jump wings, um, which is, is jumping out of planes. Uh, we call it airborne school, uh, jump wings, with bit parachute badge. Um, I earned those and I was the airborne course officer, honor graduate uh, that time around while I worked for the 18th Airborne Corps out of Fort Bragg. Um, and then putting on multiple Pride Month observances. I've done two deployed, one in Qatar, one in Kuwait. And I've done a few stateside as well. Um, and being a part of Color Guards. So thanks to knowing Danny, um, who's also on the panel, I got to be a part of the, well, Danny and um, Jesse. Uh, they got me into the Atlanta Pride Parade. So I did that one year. That was a lot of fun. Um, and they've also helped me with, with the Augusta Pride Parade. Um, and then also being part of the dedication ceremony for, I want to say it was Frank Kameni's dedication for his headstone at the um, Arlington Cemetery. So uh, that is kind of me in a nutshell. Um, I grew up in New York City. I went to school at Cornell and got my commission out of ROTC. Um, so... I know a lot of people go through different routes and you'll probably hear from a couple today. So that's that's what I've got for an introduction. Thank you. Uh, Kate, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, my name is Staff Sergeant Catherine Golston. I've been in the military for 14 years so far. I started off on active duty in 2006. Uh, I was stationed at Fort Polk, Louisiana as a medic with a uh, combat support hospital there. While I was there, I deployed twice, once to Iraq, once to Afghanistan. And then I went uh, and joined the National Guard. I was up in Wisconsin for a little while where I was their senior medic up there. Then I moved back home to Texas where I was my last unit, I was senior medic there and a platoon sergeant, and currently I'm at Fort Hood um, as a combat medic instructor. And my career 
um, I don't know. It's been, it's been really good. Um, I've had a lot of people that have been uh, very accepting of me and it's made, uh, it's made things a lot easier. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Jesse, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, my name is uh, Sergeant Jesse Dennis. I am the loudest, proudest member of the Fighting Texas Aggie class of 22. Um, I'm a Corps of Cadets green to gold cadet, so I served in the Army for eight years uh, as a indirect fire infantryman and uh, infantry squad leader, things of that nature. I've also been the uh, Georgia Outserve SLDN uh, co chapter leader, and I was also the Kansas uh, chapter leader. And now I'm the Texas MMAA chapter uh, regional director. So I've got a little bit of experience in advocacy going and um, advocating in different ways, leading uh, events for MMAA and OutServe respectively, as well as the American Veterans Report Rights in Georgia. And uh, now what I can do in Texas. Um, I'm a history major and uh, soon a, to be commissioning as an officer back in the United States Army. Thank you. Uh, Danny, would, could you introduce yourself next? Sure. Uh, my name is Danny Ingram. I am the former national president of American Veterans for Equal Rights, which is the nation's oldest LGBT veteran service organization. We're 30 years old this year. I served in the Army from 1988 to 1994. In um, around 1992, uh, Bill Clinton was running for president and was saying that if elected, he would lift the ban, which at the time I was serving was a simple statement that said uh, homosexuality is incompatible with military service. Um, I met uh, at that time a remarkable officer named uh, Colonel Margaret Kammermeyer, and she had uh, come out in order to um, help defeat the ban. After meeting her um, and a few others, I decided that um, I couldn't just sit back and allow others to, to fight my fight. So um, I came out as well. I made a statement. Um, I was um, uh, brought before a, a board and um, and they decided that uh, I should be uh, discharged under the current policy that said homosexuality is incompatible with military service. About that time, Bill Clinton was elected president. He became president in uh, 93. Uh, and we actually thought that we were going to win. And um, so my discharge was frozen at that point. Uh, and later on in that year, uh, they came up with the policy called Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which basically said you could serve in the military as long as you didn't say anything about it. Um, I had said something about it. So at that point, they, they unfroze my discharge uh, and I became one of the very first members of the military to be discharged under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. It was three weeks before uh, the end of my service. Uh, had, I already had a bar to re-enlistment. So um, with three weeks, they could have just let, let it run out, but they didn't. So I became one of the first to be discharged under uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Um, many years later, after fighting Don't Ask, Don't Tell for 20 years, uh, I was invited by the White House to witness President Obama sign the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So that was a, a great day for me and many others. Um, I am married to Staff Sergeant Eric Alva, who was at one time uh, the national spokesperson 
for the human rights campaign's uh, work on repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And that's about it for me. I'll be 60 later this year. Uh, well, happy early birthday. Um, Thank you. Was... If we get there. <laughs> um, it was really powerful. Uh, Carla, would you like to finish us off with introductions? Yes, sorry, I was having struggling with my unmuting. Uh, mine is not as cool as everybody else's before me. Uh, my name is Carla Crawford and I currently work for Texas A&M. Uh, I work in the offices of the Dean of Student Life. I work is particularly in the Dean's office. Um, I am a veteran. I served uh, close to uh, 13 years in the Army um, and I served uh, two tours to Iraq, uh, one to Baghdad and one to Tikrit. Um, <clears throat> I was actually S1, which is a human resource in everybody else's term. And so I was a part of uh, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Um, so once that got signed in, so I'm more so of an advocate of this. Um, I believe everybody should be afforded the same rights, equal rights, and what you, how you choose to live your life is your business. And, that has nothing to do with fighting a war, serving your country. Um, you bleed the same way I do, red, right? So we all have the same mission and you all are, should be afforded the same rights. And so I've witnessed and gone through a lot of um, proceedings where I've seen um, the mistreatment of uh, service members who are gay, lesbian, uh, transgender. Um, so I have seen things um, that were not the best um, in the military, but I also got to be a part of the solution, which is my favorite part. Like, let's be a part of the solution. How do we fix it? How do we become all inclusive? These are amazing people that are going to do something that 99% uh, of Americans choose not to do, right? So let them live their lives the way that they choose to live and give them every right that they have fought for this country to get. So that's enough about me. Thank you, Carla. Uh, so our first question um, is gonna be, what is it like to be a queer service member? Um, so for those of us who are currently serving um, or for those of us in the past, uh, sort of just wanted to hear a little bit more about your service experience. Uh, what is it like to be a queer service member? Um, on a normal day, it's just pretty average. Uh, I think it gets a little frustrating around Pride Month because the, all the guidelines have changed. And so whenever you're trying to do something, it's always like, well, got to get this signature and that signature and they really don't have to do it. So it's like, ah. But um, on most days, I'm I'm out at my unit. I've always I've been out at my units since my very first one. Well, my second one, um, and I haven't had any issues, um, not with with leadership or or with uh, soldiers or airmen. Um, so so yeah, I mean that's it's it's kind of uneventful for on my end, and and maybe that's just because I am. Um, a cisgender male and I'm and kind of like straight acting or whatever you would call it. Um, so, but I always make it known at some point and it, it never seems to be an issue. So I'll, I'll pass this question next. Okay, same question. Okay, um, so for me, when I first came out to my uh, unit, which was my last unit, um, I was nervous as hell. This was, God, a few months after the, like about a month or so after uh, the tweets saying that we would no longer be able to serve. And uh, I was super nervous, talked to my commander. My commander was overwhelmingly supportive. Like I was nervous and I'm like, is this a trick? I mean, he's, he seems a little too, uh, too on board with this, uh, but 
Uh, everything in that unit was amazing. Uh, I did run into some flack with another unit, but for the most part, er ever since I came out, um, every unit that I've been in other than that one was extremely supportive. All of my soldiers and other people in my unit were able to come to me. They felt like they could trust me more because they know they knew everything about me. I mean, from being the senior medic there, the platoon sergeant, being the equal opportunity leader, um, they knew that I had their back, that I was going to be honest and everything with them. And uh, it's been it's been great. I've seen a few cases where some people weren't as lucky, but um, I feel that that's changing a lot. So. Um, so I guess it's my turn. Uh, for me, I had a lot of issues. I joined right after Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed, like I think two or three months after it went into effect. So the transition period was still kind of going on when I got to my unit. Um, in basic training, I definitely was not out. Like, no way. I didn't know these people. So kind of uh, an interesting dynamic, jumping into a bunch of people and sharing a lot of information, but having to be careful with what you do share and what you don't. Um, and then my first unit, I had a, a lot of very bad experiences. This was like 2012 to 2014-ish. So I had a lot of negative experiences. I was dealing with uh, a lot of hazing and stuff like that. And um, I eventually was able to find a way out of that unit. And I was uh, even denied a deployment over it because uh, me and my leadership had a big uh, issue over me being a suspected homosexual and uh, them not wanting me to go to Afghanistan with them and stuff like that. So. Uh, early on, I had a lot of really bad experiences, um, but I really wanted to be in the Army and I loved my job, so I kept pushing through it. Um, once I PCS to 1st Infantry Division at Fort Riley, uh, it was kind of really still uncertain, like, what's going to happen? You know, how are all these people going to treat me? Is it going to be weird? Is it going to be hard? Whatever. And I had just gotten married as well. So I didn't have to live in the barracks or anything, which was awesome. But uh, so I got to my unit and, you know, there's a little bit of time where you're like, can I trust these people or can I not, you know? And then after a little while, I was like, okay, I can start bringing my spouse around, start being more and more open. And there were some small issues early on. And then my leadership kind of swept in and started fixing everything like, hey, this is not gonna, this is not cool. You're not gonna treat him like this. Uh, you know, being very supportive of me. And I think that had to do with uh, a lot of me being the best that I could be, doing the best to be a, the best soldier in my capacity, in my position that I could be. And I think the biggest way to be an advocate is to be the best at your job. and nobody can say that you're not worthy if you're better than everybody else at the same thing that they're doing. Um, so once they trusted me in my position, they were there to support me when I needed it. And then that kind of progressed into me getting opportunities to go to college and get commissioned and stuff like that because I was doing my best and they were helping me because I was actually wanting to be there and wanting to be uh, good at my job. So a little rough in the beginning with other soldiers and stuff like that, but then after kind of getting embedded and, and getting uh, an idea of how the Army works, things got better. So kind of my experience, uh, yeah. Well, my experience, of course, was back in the day, um, and it was it was very very different. Um, when I first came out, um, the people that I actually worked with, the the other soldiers, 
for the most part, were um, pretty supportive um, because they knew me. They knew me before I came out. So they knew me uh, as another soldier and they knew I was very good at, at what I was doing. Um, and um, so, so some of them, for the, for the most part, were supportive. Some, some were not. Um, my, my commander was afraid for me um, and, and, and tried to, for the most part, assign me alternate duty. Um, so it was, uh, it was more difficult, certainly at that time. But, but again, people knew me first and then they they knew me as uh, as a gay man and as a gay soldier, and they already knew who I was and that I could do my job. Um, the, I I mostly work these days with the VA, um, and I can say at this point, sadly, the VA appears to be um, a, a much more uh, entrenched old school type. Of, of organization um, and, and we have a lot of work to do there before all of you folks uh, end up using the VA. Um, so uh, that's, that's basically where my work is today. And th there's a lot of work to be done on getting the culture of, of the VA to change, to be uh, more accepting and supportive of, of LGBT uh, service members and veterans. Um, so for me, it's more so on the administrative side, uh, like the S1 side, which is the HR side. Um, it's more so being an advocate in the day-to-day -day of watching the integration of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell and how, um, so in the military, it's different and every branch has their own code that they live by, right? So in the army, we have a code that it, it, it really doesn't matter how you live your life. It's more so, um, are you willing to, to, to fight next to one another? Um, I've been in in some of the thickest battles with some of the, the most um, looking on the outside, you would think they're very egregious people, you know, you would think that they're um, bigotist or racist or whatever, um, but we're not that way. Uh, we don't believe that. Um, I was also part of the Big Red One. That's where most of my military career was. And I was very excited to hear Jesse say that when he got to the Big Red One, that's, that's where it stopped. And a lot of army units, they do a very good job of we're all inclusive, one team, one fight. Um, whatever gets you, whatever makes you happy, that's what you need to do because we got a job to do. And our job is to, to de protect and defend our country. And most of the time, I think a lot of uh, civilians, that's what we call them, you're non-military, right? So civilians, we say, um, Y'all don't understand. We are fighting for who's to the left and right of us. That's what we think about. So, of course, this is important to us about our brothers and sisters and them not being afforded the same rights and the same treatment that we that we are getting. We are they're doing the same jobs. And some of them, most of them are doing it better than we are. Right. <laughs> so they have. Um, why are, are they looked at as like they're different? Like I laughed at the beginning when they, they asked, what's your normal day? Well, they're human. So like, they do everything that you do. We don't ask you your personal business, right? So why, why, why are we taking this particular group of people and putting their business out for the masses? So my job is to let's stop doing that because you wouldn't want us doing that to you. Some, you know, it, 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 that's the way that I see it. And I think that, that if we all started looking at it like that, we wouldn't have such the resistance or as Danny said in the VA, unfortunately it, it's like that because they're still stuck in the 1980s military. In the 1980s military, 
is misogynistic. So even women or people of color aren't being looked at in the same way. So let's think about this, really? So if we're gonna restrict their rights, the same, you're restricting women's rights and people of color's rights as well. We haven't grown, right? So um, my job is to continue the advocacy. Let's fix it. Let's, let's, let's even the playing field, right? Well, um, it was really enlightening. Uh, so the second question we have um, is, what are some common misconceptions about queer service members um, and how can we combat those misconceptions? So I believe we're gonna be all on the same page here. Uh, the misconceptions are that we can't get the mission done, that we can't, that we're not suited for the stressors of combat, uh, the combat environment or stress in general. Um, and then what we do to fight that is just do our jobs and do it well. Um, not to say that we can't bring issues to our chain of command um, or complain, but when we do that, we bring facts, we bring the regulations, and we bring plans on how to fix what is within our scope to fix. Um, so that's how, and that's how I've seen it. Like it, to Carla's point, to Jesse's point, Danny, Everyone, right? Do your job, do it well, and people will respect you for that. And then when they see something like you being treated wrongly, they'll step in for you. So I'll pass it off to Kate, to Catherine. Okay, um, I, I completely agree. Um, but I would also add that uh, being visible, uh, is, is a big part because like until I came out to my unit it was just oh well you know these these trans people we don't know what they're going to do we don't you know we think that they're um, going to do xyz and we don't like that and they they had no idea they didn't know anyone that was trans so they I mean you don't know what you don't know so I mean education and visibility I mean is the best thing that you could uh, you could bring to that Yeah, um, same here. A lot of uh, agreements on basically what's been covered. I think uh, a lot of the misconceptions that follow queer service members into the military are a lot of the same ones that follow queer people in uh, general life across um, both the United States and around the world. Like people may see us out of a uh, ignorant light, lacking knowledge on what queer people are like or what we do every day and what our desires are and stuff like that. It's uh, that ignorance that feeds into an idea that gay men are uh, more effeminate and therefore weak in whatever sense or not physically strong or lacking in the ability to think in certain ways, whatever it is. And those, those misconceptions uh, coming from that hyper-masculine culture that follow people in the civilian world, follow service members into their military career and people who have those misconceptions, it's generally out of that same ignorance. And when you educate them or show them or somehow enlighten them to what queer people are actually like and what they're capable of, regardless of their background, and it's, it's all about what individuals can do and how they can impact the climate and the mission and stuff like that that's when they start to understand that there's not really that much of a difference between queer people cisgendered people straight people and trans people there it's all humans with different backgrounds and i think just showing that we're not that different that's what's going to change the misconceptions about us not being able to do the job or what have you. One of the reasons that it was very important for me to, to come out um, at the time I did was for that very reason. We are, uh, for the most part, an invisible minority. And, and that invisibility 
allows people to uh, tell lies and, and um, demonize us and, and the policies in the military that would not allow us to be authentic or true to ourselves uh, just allowed that to continue. I wanted them to see and to know who I was so they wouldn't be afraid we're going to change this policy and then all of these people are going to come in here. I wanted them to know that we were already there and that we were among the best of them. Uh, I, I, and I really needed them to know that, that this wasn't going to bring new people into the military that hadn't been there before. It was just going to, to allow those of us who were already there to be uh, open about, about who we were. Uh, and and that, that is uh, something we still fight with today and why it's so very important to come out so people can see who we are and that uh, the, the lies and the misconceptions that they're told are untrue. Um, and, and I think all of you are, are doing a great job of that um, and showing these people are an important part of the team. Uh, they always have been and always will be. They're good at their job and that's all that matters. Uh, I think one of the misconceptions that I did see a lot was the attitude difference. So I think that the misconception was that um, queer service members, were, their attitude was going to be more flamboyant than they wouldn't mind, right? They're not going to mind their manners. They're not going to fall in line. They're not going to, I think one of the major things during the repeal of don't ask, don't tell life in one of the think tanks was, well, what if they want to show up to formation with a purse? <laughs> Bro, I can't even do that. Like, <laughs> like, this is unreasonable. You know what I'm saying? Like, this, you're not even thinking reasonably, right? So they were making things, like, they, they were just making things up. Like, it's, you don't even do that. So I, I think I will keep honing into my point is they're human beings. <clears throat> they are human beings that choose to live their life their way. They don't have to conform to your way. They don't have to abide by your rules. They don't have to have the same beliefs that you have. But let me tell you something that they all have that most of Americans do not have. They serve this country. They took an oath that most Americans will not take. So, I mean, to me, like, I, I don't understand why you don't just treat them like human beings and why are we digging into their personal business? It's their personal business and you should give them their rights afforded to them as a human being, give them their rights afforded to them as a contributing member of society, as somebody that's in the military, right? Because there's a lot of Americans that are not. So, I mean, that's all I got. So, um, so looking forward, um, as many of y'all know, Texas A&M um, has one of the biggest um, military cadet populations outside of the big institutions for that. Um, and so I wanted to get see if y'all had any advice for any future queer service members. Uh, it goes back to combating misconceptions. Be yourself and be good at your job. Um, that's that's like the best advice I, I can give you. Again, if you're good at your job, people will take notice, people will respect you, and people will step in to defend you if they need to. So. Hmm. So as far as uh, being trans and being in the military, so current policy says that we're allowed to serve 
we're allowed to be open, but we're not allowed to transition unless we had already started before the policy changed. So that being said, um, if it's something you wanna do, I mean, by all means go for it. They are going to limit you until at some point when policy changes. Uh, but until then, I mean, there's, there's lots of support out there. Um, the units that I've seen have been very supportive, even if you're not able to, to transition uh, medically, then, I mean, you're still able to be who you are. So, and you're still able to, to serve, uh, serve your country and uh, go forth and do great things. Um, this is a question I have quite a bit of experience with uh, being in the Corps myself and having a lot of a lot more interaction with prospective service members and, and future uh, officers and stuff like that is, well, they'll come to me and they'll be like, well, do you have advice? You know, what can you tell me about being in the military or being in the army or whatever? And uh, the like biggest thing I can harp on is if you really want to be in the military, do it because it's what you want to do. It's, I mean, the money's not the best and there's great benefits um, most of the time, but do it because it's what you want, not because um, it is just a thing to do. Because if you get into it and you don't like it, well, you're stuck there. Like you're either going to get kicked out or, or you're going to wait it out. And the other thing is get in with a job that you actually want, like do your research and find what you actually want to do, even in the civilian world and find it in the military and do that. Like you may not always get the perfect assignment. You may not always get the perfect actual job at your unit, but do something that you actually want to do because your happiness is not worth, um, just being in the military, do something that makes you happy. Like look forward to going into work. Like I love my job and being away from my actual work is kind of hard for me, but I love going into work and I love what I do. So, you know, my happiness uh, is substantiated by my work. So very often I see people and this can be um, very true for queer service members as well is they'll get to their job and they just hate it, um, which is not the best for anyone. Like no one wants to go to a job they don't like. So um, as a queer person, it can be hard, especially in combat units and infantry and line units and stuff like I do, because it's a, it is a still a very masculine environment and it's dominated by that uh, kind of attitude. So if that's not an environment, that you don't think that you're going to be happy and maybe do a little bit more research and find what's going to make you comfortable and happy um, and go into a line of work in the military or outside or as a contractor or whatever that more well aligns with what you want. Um, but if you think that, you know, being in the dirt and doing the hard work is what you want and that's something that makes you happy, and you feel comfortable being a queer person in that environment, then absolutely go into it, but do your research. That is the biggest advice that I have for anyone going into the military is figure out what you actually want to do. Be authentic. And uh, as Jonathan said, be professional. Um, in, in any field that you're in, um, if you are good at what you do, uh, you will be respected. Um, and for any minority group coming in to the military or, or other things for the first time, you're going to have to be twice as good as anybody else. Um, and and uh, it, it's going to be that way uh, for a while. Uh, but uh, be, uh, be authentic. Um, because uh, being able to work with other people means that they need to know that you're telling them the truth. And that, that's particularly important in the military 
where you have to trust the person who's next to you to save your life if if uh, if they're called upon to do so and when they when they talk about the bond um that that is in the military unit cohesion the things that uh hold the unit together and make it function as a unit are, are trust and and uh you need to be able to trust the person next to you uh be be truthful about who you are um uh, and and be good at your job and 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 those things will create the change that um will will change ultimately the um the military and uh and the veterans administration too Uh, the best advice for someone who wants to go into the military is you got to make sure that's what you want to do. Like for me, I knew that's what I wanted to do when I was like 10 years old. It was either it was that and play basketball. And I thought I was going to do both, <laughs> you know, so I mean, you got to make sure that's what you want to do because you are literally giving up everything that you know, everything that you thought your upbringing your history, your past, all the things that made you who you are, you are leaving that wherever you're from. You're leaving it there. Because the moment that you cross that threshold, you are no longer you. You are now US Army, US Marine Corps, United States Coast Guard, United States Navy, that's what you are. You are no longer, I am no longer me, and you are no longer you. So you gotta be willing to give up and that doesn't mean change who you are. So know the difference. So giving up everything that you know and changing who you are, those are totally different things. Be who you are, but know that you're giving up. Um, you're giving up your cushy life or what you're used to, or maybe you're not so cushy life, right? Um, you're giving those things up. You're, you're, you're making a commitment, good, bad, or indifferent. Like that means <laughs> if, tomorrow, you know, we have to go across the water. That means that's what you have to do. You don't, there's no, there's no debating in the military. And all of the, all of us who signed up know that we, we know that we're aware of that. We're aware that we are giving up um, our right to choose, but we are not giving up our right to be treated equal, right? So you're not giving up your right to be treated equal. You're not giving up your, your right to be who you are. You're not giving up your right to your beliefs. And you're actually gaining a whole, like a mafia of a family. Uh, some of my, I will tell you my best friends in the whole world that have been with me through the craziest things are from the army, are from the army. I still talk to them to this day. I still see them. Um, they are like family. Whenever somebody has a baby, it's like we all had a baby. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, because when you go to war and you don't know if you're gonna go home the next night and the only person that you have next to you is Jesse, Catherine, Jonathan, those are the, those are the only people that are next to you. Do you really, really want to withhold them, withhold their, their rights from them? Really? Think about that. You want to make sure you get home. I want to make sure they get home. So if you're going to join the military, you got to make sure this is what you want to do. Because the number one thing in the military is selfless service. So every one of these people whatever reason we all chose to go in some people go in because they're leaving a bad life or nobody will accept them and the military man we accept everybody we don't care man i will tell you i have known some of the people that back home they were probably called extreme racist they are not they are my homies they like they are some of the greatest people ever but you wouldn't know that if you were not, if I had not been exposed to them in the army. So just know that you're gonna get exposed to a whole, whole lot. So also know that going in, but let it be your decision. 
Don't let others influence you. Make that choice for you. Only you can make it. Because at the end of the day, when those when when you say I do solemnly swear to uphold the Constitution, it's only you. It's not you and and your friends, Kate and Kate plus eight. Okay, it's not Kate plus eight friends. It's just you. Thank you. Um, so thinking about um, people who are not service members or maybe are service members, do you have any advice um, for future advocates on how we can help make a difference um, for this community? Sorry, I'm, I'm over here thinking about that one. That was kind of the toughest question. Um, well, can we... Uh, Define advocates. Are we talking about allies, or are we just talking about civilians who support military members? Um, I think everyone can define it um, for themselves. What that means for them. I guess when we wrote the question, we were probably thinking more about allies. But um, if you have a broader definition or a different perspective, I think we want to welcome that. Uh, yeah. So. I think my answer would be for, for allies. Um, it's just to be what we call good battle buddies, uh, good shipmates, good wingmen, uh, and good friends. Uh, that's what it comes down to. Um, you know, be there for, for the folks who come out to you and who trust you um, with their life. And then also remember that just because one LGBT service member might, you know, let you say the F word or make all these gay jokes. Doesn't mean that the next one will. So you have to be flexible in that people have different boundaries um, when it comes to sexuality. So, so it's, it's just that. And it's just being a good friend, knowing who that person is, um, what their humor is like, what what being down, what their energy level looks like when it's up or when it's down. Um, that's all I can, that's all what really came to my mind. Yeah, when I heard that question, I'm like, oh my gosh, um, I don't know. Um, so what, what came to my mind first was how can, how can, what can we do or what can people do for those that are, that are like not able to to speak their voice which ones are still in the closet whether they be you know lgbtq where, wherever they fall on the spectrum um being able to be um uh, you know just an ear or a shoulder for them um and maybe even being a voice for them if they can't so like there's quite a few trans uh service members that are currently serving that have to stay in the closet because they're not allowed to transition and uh, because they didn't make the, the cutoff. And I, I know that that's extremely, an extremely difficult thing for them, but being able to be there for them, being willing to listen, listening is extremely important and uh, being able to just be a, a, a voice for those that can't use it, can't use theirs. So um, when I think of the, the way that the question asks about advocacy, I think of it more like in the professional sense, like kind of what I do, where I uh, kind of coordinate and go to events and stuff like that. And I think the biggest way to be a, a great advocate is to find either local or national or whatever um, propositions and, and legislature and stuff like that and go out there and be a voice uh, as publicly and as loudly as you possibly can and, and do the things to change the culture. You know, when someone say, says something that is not cool, speak out and, you know, put a stop to it. When someone's treating someone badly, you know, put a stop to it and be there. And then that also goes for uh, the legal sense, you know, when uh, there's legislature to, I don't know, ban trans people from using the bathroom, for example, go to 
the hearings for that legislature and go and do something about it, be the voice, uh, advocate, you know, do it. And that's the biggest thing. Be there, be outspoken, be in the public eye and do your best to change the culture that surrounds uh, our nation and how our nation perceives uh, queer people. I, I, I think for me, when, when you look at the history of, of the military, every new minority group had to fight to be in the military. Um, a, a racial minorities were separated. They had to fight for their, their ability to serve. Uh, uh, women, um, gay, lesbian, and bisexual people, and now transgender people. Each group can fight that fight, or we can try to bring about a systemic change that allows every group to be able to, to uh, fulfill what they want to do. We, we change the system so that it's not each new group having to fight to get their way in. We, we create a system that allows uh, for everyone to be able to, um, to, um, to, to, to do what they want to do. And that means when you see something wrong, being done wrong to another group, um, then you speak up for them. Um, and for instance, right now, it, it, the fact that transgender people are not allowed to serve um, is, is offensive to me. Uh, I had to fight and I lost. Eventually we won. Um, but we have to be champions of change for everyone because there will be another group and then another group, and then another group, and another group that has to fight the same fight over and over again until we create a society where everybody's free to be who they want to be. So it's being a champion for everyone. When you see somebody being treated unfairly, it doesn't matter who they are. Um, you need to step in and, and be the person that you wish you had had on your side when you were fighting. Um, so that it, it's more of a, uh, we need to change society so that diversity doesn't become one new group after another fighting for their place at the table. We need to pull out all those chairs from the table right away and let everyone have a, a, a place to sit down. I think I'm just going to piggyback on that. I mean, um, it's what can the outside communities do? We can't withhold any rights from any human being. Um, all human beings should be afforded the same rights. Human beings, they are not property. They are not some weird species. They didn't come from Mars. They are human beings. They bleed red, just like, I don't know if any of you have met someone that has a different color blood than the rest of us. Um, I don't know if like, uh, do they make that? I don't know if that's a thing, but last time I checked, it's not. So the last time I checked, we're all human beings. So we shouldn't be withholding any rights from anybody. Everybody be, should be afforded the same rights to do the same thing. Uh, like Danny said, we can't, we, you think about all the minority groups and at the end of the day, minority or not, they're still human beings. So why are we treating each other like we're, like there's some kind of weird species in that, that they're not the same? So Danny's not the same as me. Tori's not the same as me. Catherine's not the same as me. We're just, some of us are a little bit, you know, been out in the sun a little bit longer than others. Some of us got different seasoning than others. You know what I'm saying? We different flavors, chat but we all have the same color blood, which is red. 
So we shouldn't be withholding any rights from anybody. So if you wanna help, then make sure that everybody has the same rights across the board, but especially service members, especially service members, their rights should be afforded to them first because they're fighting for you to be able to say, oh, let them have rights. Think about that. They're fighting for you to be able to get to say yes or no to them having rights. Let's just treat everybody equally and fair. We all are human beings. Um, I know Jesse and Danny uh, both touched on some resources, so I wanted to shout those out really quickly before we get into the audience questions. Um, Jesse is a part of the Modern Military Association of America, um, which is the biggest LGBT uh, military advocacy group. Um, if you want to look them up online, they're also on the center's website, um, and so you can go and see them. I know they're doing a newsletter, um, which was really interesting, their past issue. Uh, the Buffalo, if you're here in Texas, in Houston, uh, there's the Buffalo Soldier Museum, uh, which talks about the fight for African Americans um, to be able to serve. And so they go into those specific uh, units and the history of discrimination and stuff um, that, that those units faced. Um, and then Conduct Unbecoming, uh, which is the history of gays and lesbians in the US military by Randy Schultz, which the center has. Um, unfortunately, it's not open right now, but uh, that is a pretty comprehensive book starting back in the 1770s um, and going, um, I think, right up until uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell was implemented. I don't know if there's been a new edition um, that goes past that, but it gives a pretty comprehensive history um, going over a lot of uh, what people have touched on. And so if you're interested in learning more about that, um, they also go into women's struggle to serve um, in African Americans and sort of the segregation both of those groups experience. Um, with that being said, we want to encourage those on Facebook um, to chime in and ask their questions. Uh, we have one so far, so I will get us rolling with our first audience question. And that is, um, did you ever feel that you needed to hide who you are? So, so I entered around the same time Jesse entered. Um, I literally commissioned August of 2011 and repeal was effective September of 2011. Uh, but I started, I started on the quiet side. I was like, I don't really need to come out. Like there's no point to it. Um, but I went to an outserve conference. Um, oof. It was probably a year later in 2012, November, 2012. And I came back from that and I was like, you know, I went back to visibility. Um, and I was like, how can I be useful to my soldiers at the time? You know, that was our army. I was like, how can I be useful to them and help them transition um, or make compatible their military life and their social life, their, their civilian, their private life? Because uh, I was also a reservist, right? So. You know, you're only in uniform one week in a month, <laughs> two weeks out of the year, technically, it could be more. But, um, and so you had people who, you could have people who might perform as drag queens on the weekend and then come into uniform in what, what their gender identity was. So um, I, then saw that if I wanted to help people um, deconflict their lives, um, that I needed to step out first and say, hey, I am, you know, a, a gay man who's serving, who was wearing this uniform. You know, if you, I have no qualms crossing both worlds, but if you find that you have uh, some barriers, like let's talk about it and I'm here for you. Uh, so, so I think that was, it wasn't ever, uh, it was a little bit in the beginning. It was like, oh, I, I can not do it. You know, I'm just here one week in a month. But then I realized that that's not congruent with, with what a leader is supposed to do, which is lead from the front, um, step out and be there as a resource for their 
their their soldiers, their airmen, sailors, marines. When I first came out, um, I was uh, I was really nervous. I was uh, at that time I was looking to go into recruiting for the Texas Army National Guard, and uh, I reached out to several different organizations because I was nervous. Um, because I'm like, is this is this organization organization going to be accepting of me? Um, are they going to kick me out? Even though policy says this, I know what history says on what has happened to uh, uh, gay, lesbian, and, and uh, bisexual service members uh, in the past. So uh, I reached out and um, I got a hold of uh, Sparta, and they were able to uh, to assist me a great deal, and uh, they helped they helped me out a lot. And um, it's been uh, it's been a really good, it's been a very positive experience for me. So, um, but being able to, to be out, um, I feel more comfortable with my unit. I'm able to get the job done. I feel like more, more efficiently because I'm not having to pretend. I'm not having to think about more than what I'm supposed to be doing. So it's helped me. Um, so like I said, when I was doing my intro early on, I had a lot of issues, uh, like six, seven years ago when I was a young, uh, fresh infantryman, just out of basic, I had a lot of issues with my unit and I definitely, I was out to my family and to my friends and everything, but at work was not the same story. I was private dentist. I went to work. I went home. That was it. They didn't know almost anything about my private life, and I preferred to keep it that way. Um, I was very afraid of what might happen. I, you know, I had heard all the horror stories of, you know, well, he was this and they were that, and we, you know, beat the hell out of them or whatever. Um, and I, I definitely was in the closet at work. And when uh, I had been in the unit for a while, things started to, you know, people started, hey, why aren't you adding me on Facebook? Or, um, you know, why don't we ever see you out at the bar or whatever, you know, those questions started getting asked. And then um, eventually things started to come to light. Well, Dennis was here with this person at this time and they were, you know, hanging out. And I saw this picture of him with this person and stuff like that. So the rumors started spreading and um, people basically started to figure it out. Um, this was coming close to the time when I was about to leave the unit. Um, well, actually it started around the time we were gearing up for deployment, which was about 10, 11, 12 months, somewhere around there, uh, just shy of a year before I was gonna leave the unit. So I was gonna do the deployment, come home, PCS. Uh, my platoon sergeant got ear of it. Um, it was basically decided that I wasn't fit to fill my duty position, and so I didn't go. Um, I ended up going and doing other things. Uh, for those of you who don't, who don't know, PCSing is when you uh, go from one uh, duty station to another. It's a permanent change of station. So uh, I was supposed to come back from the deployment and. Uh, leave there and go somewhere else. So uh, I didn't go on the deployment, ended up doing some other things while they were gone and then left the unit. So mostly went off without too many problems uh, actually coming up other than obviously me, me not getting to go. Uh, then I got to my next unit and I was you know, pretty worried that I was gonna have the same experience like is this going to be better is this going to be worse uh, you know how how can I uh, trust these people when I just spent you know three or four years with people and it turned out I couldn't trust them so uh, I got there I was just married um, and I was like well let's just see what happens so I started bringing my husband around to the unit hey this is my spouse you know cool. Um, and 
a lot of people were unsure of how to feel. Um, and I was definitely unsure of how to feel. But over time, as people got to know me and as people got used to me being around, I got a lot more support. And whenever I had issues, that was dealt with. And ever since then, uh, I've been a lot more comfortable being open. And ever since I became a, uh, a sergeant, I've gotten to a point where I really don't care uh, what anyone has to say. I don't care if you're a civilian, a private, a sergeant major, or a colonel. I'm me, and nothing you can do is going to change that, and I have no reason to hide myself. So that's kind of my experience with uh, going from hiding my entire life to being extremely open about who I am. I, um, I had to hide. Uh, when, when I, when I uh, first came out, uh, most of the members of my unit were most upset about the fact that I hadn't told them before. So uh, they, were not, they were not angry about the fact that I was gay. They were upset that I had not confided in them to let them know the truth before. So it was almost like a society waiting to drag us all out of the closet so that we could, we could show them who we were and, and change them. Um, but for me and for, for so very, very many people, um, we weren't able to be out at all. And, and so I, I see um, uh, these wonderful young people uh, getting to serve today. And um, that, that, is, that is my victory um, as well. And uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, it's been my experience that I can speak for uh, from my lens is everybody struggles with being who they are when they first initially enter and it probably takes a lot of us several years to truly be who we are and to live in our truth. I think that's one of the great things about the military is the military forced me to own my truth. I may not have the same um, walk as far as the rest of them in, in, in that aspect, but I have uh, the similar plight with my race and, and with also being a woman. I was in a predominantly all-male unit for quite some time, um, and I had to, uh, and no, I didn't change who I was. I was me. I grow up, I have all brothers. I don't have any sisters. I have sister-in-laws now, but I, I grew up with all brothers. So it was, it's nothing to me for me to be in an environment with all boys or all men. Um, I'm going to shoot the way I shoot. And if I happen to outshoot you, that's your problem. You work that out. Um, <laughs> but we all struggle with being who we are when we, when we first go in. And some of us, even after we've been in for a while, we still struggle with living in our truth. The, the military has a funny way of holding up a mirror and showing you who you really are. And some of us, um, our, our, our insides aren't so great. And, and the military has a funny way of airing that out. Um, luckily, in most cases, I will say not all, but in most cases, you have enough people around you who are just as jacked up as you are. So you're fine. <laughs> you fit right in. <laughs> like, so we all struggle with that. And I think um, when, again, when, you, when you're delving into to people's personal lives, because this is something that we're asking them all to be very personal and defend when I don't have to defend who I sleep with. Do you? Why should they? So uh, I, 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 we all struggle with being who we are, um, and I think that some of that come. I think some of the prejudice that uh, that is put forth on on, on that community on all, on minority communities as a whole is fear, fear because you don't know 
we all were human beings and we like to be in control and we like to think that we know everything. We don't know anything, but we like to think that we do. And so because we don't know what that, well, that's different. You know, you're, you know, you're two dudes, right? Like, <laughs> why is it your business? It's different. So that's your ignorance. It's not your business because you didn't choose to live that way. Um, don't make them, uh, don't make them the, the, the scapegoat for your, your extraness that we don't all get our commentary to add to, right? So uh, you don't get to give your commentary about who I sleep with. And I, I definitely shouldn't be giving my commentary on who you sleep with. Or who you don't sleep with. <laughs> that part, but they be lying though. Um, so we have a second um, question on Facebook. Again, we want to encourage people to ask if they've got them. Uh, so our second question on Facebook um, is, how would you respond to President Trump's famous tweet, our military must be focused on a decisive and overwhelming victory and cannot be burdened with the tremendous medical cost and disruption that transgender in the military would entail. I'll I wonder how, stuff in how much on, on that uh, a little bit. Um, the, the Pentagon's own studies have shown that the military spends more money on Viagra than it does on taking care of, of um, gender issues for transgender service members. So I'd ask uh, the president to give us a list of all the people he thinks cannot serve. Uh, that would be uh, men with erectile dysfunction, since we're having to spend so much money on that. Um, and uh, are, are we not supposed to take care of anyone in the military, for instance, if someone has PTSD? Uh, should we take care of them? Should we get them counseling? Or should we just ask them to leave the military? I, I think that the president not having any experience of the military himself uh, probably does not have answers for uh, these issues uh, that that um, the the military itself already came up with the answers for these issues, and and he would do a lot better to follow the advice of people who have served instead of speaking up as someone who didn't serve when it was required that you serve. For me, when uh, when I heard the tweets, like I said earlier, I was I was terrified. But as there's been a long record of my brothers and sisters that are that happen to be trans, that we've gone through, we've done amazing things. Uh, we excel uh, in our jobs, and uh, I mean that there is no proof. I mean that that we cannot serve. <clears throat> and uh, as Danny was talking about, in uh, I believe it was either 2018 or 19, the uh, amount, the the cost, uh, it's that trans care is one tenth the cost of Viagra that the military spends. So um, I, I'm not going to say too much more because I don't want to get myself in trouble. But uh, I mean, the statistics, you know, speak for themselves on what we've done. Uh, I think both of them really hit the nail on the head with that. And there's not really uh, much else that can be said. I've, I've served with uh, quite a few transgender individuals uh, in infantry uh, battalions and armor battalion and in a cavalry squadron. So across the board of frontline echelons. And I've 
never seen evidence that any of these individuals on a practical level have any more or less capability to perform the required tasks uh, that any other individual in the organizations could. That there's no correlation. Um, so on in that aspect of it, it's just a, it doesn't make sense. Like you're, ex it would be excluding individuals who are fully capable of performing the job. So um, other than all of the obvious costs and all of that, that statistically don't make sense. But in that aspect of the actual practicality of individuals in in the uh, echelon, there's there's just no no real reason to exclude anyone uh, capable of performing their duties. Um, getting some, oh. Can, can I, it just, to, just to follow up with that again, here in, in San Antonio, we have um, a massive flight wing of um, C-5 transports located here. And uh, you'll see them flying over the city all the time as they make practice runs. Uh, each one of those planes costs a, a quarter of a hundred million dollars and more. And you want to ask, who is it that you want taking care of that asset, that plane? Who is it that you want flying it? Who is it that you want loading it? Um, we need and deserve to have the best qualified individuals to do that job. And it does not matter who they are. We need them to be there. If they want to be there, if they volunteered to be there, that is much better than someone who does not want to serve at all. So if they're there, they're doing their job, they're keeping our country safe, then let them serve. There's no reason that they should not be able to. And we as citizens have a right to say that all the money that we have spent on training those individuals is well invested in keeping our country safe and we need to keep them we need to be giving people reasons to get into the military instead of finding reasons to try to get rid of people who want to be there. Um, thank you. Those were some uh, really powerful thoughts. Uh, another audience question we have from Facebook um, is what are the LGBTQ plus demographics like around you? Okay, so um, I actually came to a unit and I had two gay airmen um, in my squadron at one point. Now there's just one other. Um, I know there are a few around the base and uh, to include, you know, enlisted and officers. Um, all the officers are generally CGOs, our company grade officers. So um, ranks of Lieutenant to Captain, that's for Army and Air Force and Marines. Um, Navy, it's like Ensign to Lieutenant Junior Grade or something like that. Uh, it's the first couple of ranks. So um, that's, depending on where you are, there's, there's a mix, right? There's, um, I've definitely seen, now that we have, don't ask, don't tell, a lot of, we have generals who have come out, Major General Tammy Smith, Major General Randy Taylor. Um, we've had uh, folks that were SEALs. Um, what's her name? Help me out here. Kristen Beck. Yes, Kristen Beck. And there was uh, Brett, Brett something. I can't remember his last name. Um, Jones. Yes. Brett Jones, um, we've, or so, but around me in particular, I do have a few, there's a few um, enlisted and officers, uh, male, mostly. I haven't seen any, and while all there's a female officer um, that are LGB or T or Q on, on the spectrum somewhere. 
I can't even keep count of the number of LGBT people I've served with in, with my, within my units. Uh, when I was with the combat support hospital, there were, this was before Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed. And we knew that they were gay. We knew that they were bi. We didn't care. They were able to do their job. And that was it. Um, I had about four people there on active duties when I came out um, in 2017. I had a non-binary person come out to me. I had uh, a couple people that were bi. I had like four other soldiers um, that told me that they were gay. I mean, it's it's been a non-issue. So I mean, I've we we are everywhere. So I mean, you pick a unit and there's going to be LGBT people there. Oh, especially the medical field and the law field. They're like the biggest fields for. The track, the LGBT. You're not wrong. <laughs> yeah, uh, same for me. Like, um, from like all the combat units I've been in, and just across the board, going to uh, different duty stations and meeting different people, like everywhere. I've I've met. Uh, I've had soldiers that were queer that uh, reported to me. Um, I've worked with people who were queer uh met transgender people all over this the uh different organizations and the and the higher units just everywhere like you never know who you're going to meet and the diversity not only in uh the queer community but you'll meet people from all over the world i had soldiers who were in the u.s army from germany uh georgia the the country in the middle or uh south of russia i've had soldiers from uh romania i've soldiers from korea all over the place and people of different cultures and backgrounds you're going to have service members working with you always from who knows where and from what kind of cultures and backgrounds so you'll have that huge range of diversity no matter where you go in the military Alrighty, um, so uh, we've got another audience question. Um, give me one sec. All right. Um, do LGBT military members get the necessary health care um, and same benefits their fellow service members? Or um, the culture of homophobia and discrimination still persists inside the Army? Uh, I'm going to start by Going back to my first answer, or was it the second? No, the second question about um, what's it like to be a queer service member? I said it was frustrating only around pride, but it's also frustrating actually when I transfer bases and I have to get a new uh, medical provider um, because then I have to educate them on PrEP and be like, yeah, hey, I'm on this PrEP. They're like, what's PrEP for? You don't know? No, what did, what, tell, us, tell me about it. Well, it's for pre-exposure prophylaxis. It's for um, preventing HIV. And somehow I say preventing HIV and they get, oh, so you came in contact with someone who had HIV. Oh, this is really not my lane. You need to go see infectious disease. I'm like, no, 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 no. Possibly, yes, I've probably come, come I have come into contact with people who are, you know, un, untransmittable, undetectable. Um, but that's not, a, it's not about that. It's, it's about going forward and always being protected after that. So it's it can be a little frustrating with the healthcare system sometimes. Um, I've had to, uh, when I got here to Holloman Air Force Base in particular, um, I had to talk to like three different doctors before. One of them was like, okay, I got what you're, what you're saying. We'll do this. We'll do the blood work that you got in the past and we'll get you rolling again. And I was like, good, good. So um, it's, it's a little bit of a, it can be a little bit of an educational moment for, for gives you an opportunity to teach someone else about the needs of, of LGBT folks. Um, and I know that mine is probably by far the simplest thing to teach on, so. Oh my gosh. So it, uh, sometimes it can be a little awkward 
Um, I remember going into the VA and uh, seeing my primary care provider and he's not even paying that much attention to me. He's just looking at my notes. And then he's like, oh, you don't have a pap smear. You're correct. I haven't had a pap smear. <laughs> and uh, they just, it's, it's a big education thing. And especially in the medical field, being in the medical field, um, I, I don't have a problem taking the time to educate the people because they're not going to magically know. I mean, they have to be told. They have to be given the right information. So, um, but outside of that, I mean, uh, in the military, at the VA, I've gotten outstanding care. So. Um, for me, uh, I personally haven't had a lot of issues because I usually just go straight to the, uh, the unit's uh, physician for whatever I need. Um, and when it comes to issues that I've had to deal with, it more relates to my spouse. So uh, when you're in the military and uh, you are active duty, your spouse go, primarily will go to the on-post hospital uh, for their care. And that's been where I come into issues is having to get my spouse care. Well, who is this? Is this your brother? Is this your dependent? Who, what, what is this? And then I'm like, well, no, this is my spouse. We're married and he needs this. Um, so that kind of links back into that misinformation and misunderstanding of culture and stuff like that. And then um, after that, it kind of just goes into where there are hiccups in the uh, Army's medical care in general and uh, dealing with where the Army will I've never heard of this issue. What are we supposed to do about it? You know, and having to help them get through that so that we can get the care that we need. Um, but other than that, uh, I haven't had a whole lot of issues myself. The, the culture issue again at, at the VA, um, when you first go in and hit that wall of, of um, uh, prejudice, uh, discrimination, how can you possibly uh, work with someone who uh, is ignorant of your issues, um, who uh, isn't, isn't up to um, current understandings of, of issues that you face as an LGBT person uh, is difficult. And, and that is an area where the VA um, needs to change. Hopefully, as, as some of the providers age out, uh, we'll, we'll get better support, but we have to push for that. Um, we, we have to tell the VA that they're not meeting the needs of some service members. Uh, and we have to push them to do that because that's their job. I think the military healthcare system as a whole has a giant disconnect. Um, so uh, to answer the, the, do they receive the same benefits? Absolutely. So once you become active duty, you automatically, it doesn't matter. So we, I see this a lot in uh, soldiers that are Islamic. Um, so we have a lot of Islamic soldiers, believe it or not. Yes, that are in the military. It's crazy. It's the thing. Um, so I see it a lot with our Islamic soldiers. Um, they can only receive certain type of care, certain type of food, certain type of things. And there's a lot of stigmatism around that, right? Um, and, and so, but guess what? At the end of the day, they once they sign on that dotted line and they get their first paycheck, they are afforded all the same um, medical. So yes, they do get the same benefits because it's not tied to what you do with your life. It's tied to you as the, the person, the service member. Um, every 
post, or uh, that's what we call them in the army, every post, which is our base, is different in every standard of care and the standard of care that is given to your dependents, which is your family members. So that is your spouse and your children. And it could also be your parents or your siblings if they meet certain qualifications for them to be a dependent. So your dependents are entitled to they get to shop at certain places, they get medical care, um, but their medical care is at a military facility. And if they go outside of the military facility, it will end up costing the service member uh, some money. Not, a, not as much as it normally would, but a little bit of money. So every service member, it does not matter <laughs> what their race, creed, origin, belief system, they can like dating pickles okay like it doesn't matter <laughs> we they get they if something happens to that service member or their family they get to go to the emergency care either right there on post or um off post so and if you uh, if those service members are, are are receiving resistance there is um patient advocacy and they've done a better job of making patient advocacy I'm pretty sure Catherine can back me on that. They have done a much better job in um, doing, making sure that pa patient advocacy steps in and, 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 and re-educate. That's, that's the term that we use in the military. We are going to retrain you. So we don't call you bad and we don't tell you that you're dumb and like you're very like uneducated. <laughs> we just say that you need some retraining. So if <laughs> you use the wrong language, it's fine. We'll just retrain you. Um, so we have two more questions um, and then we'll wrap up with final thoughts. Uh, so our next question is, hey everyone. So my question is, have you served under a homophobic CO? Um, I'm gonna assume CO stands for commanding officer, just for those who don't know. Uh, that affected your duties um, and how have you handled that? Did you put up with it? Did you seek some sort of change? How did you go about it? Oh, I guess I'm the only one that um, has served underneath one. Okay. <laughs> so um, what happened was um, we have um, in the army, we have EO, which is equal opportunity. And so equal opportunity officers, um, they act as it, their senior leadership. So they're like senior NCOs and um, officers. Um, and they, it's kind of get voluntold um, but the, uh, they get voluntold, like, this is your job now. Um, oh, in addition to all the other things that you have to do. Um, <laughs> and so the EO, um, officer usually comes in. And so what happened with this particular CEO, the EO officer was called in and an investigation was launched. So the military, we're really good at investigating our own, locking up our own. We have our own prisons. We have our, <laughs> we have our own court system, our own judicial system. We have our own everything. It is literally a whole nother world outside of like what everybody else is used to, right? So they launched an investigation and he was found of course guilty of those. Um, and so he ended up being relieved of his command, which means he's no longer in he's no longer the commanding officer and he has a permanent write-up in his permanent jacket which for all of us who are military that's that's a big deal we don't want those okay if you get a permanent write-up in your jacket like your jacket that is who we are that's our identity we try to make that jacket look so pretty we go we jump out of planes <laughs> perfectly good working planes just to make our jackets look good. So for him to have that type of uh, write-up permanently put in his jacket, he probably will never make major, to be honest, which is the next rank. Um, he was a captain, so he will probably never make major with that type of write-up. Um, so the, the, the Army and all uh, branches of the service, they have things in place, equal opportunity. Um, we have 
we have all of the same things that you see out in the civilian world um, as far as we have our own police, we have our own judges, <laughs> we, we, we have our own laws. We literally have to learn all new laws. So when somebody, even with the comments that were made to Jesse um, and his spouse, um, if that was turned over to EO, that person probably would have lost their job quickly. It's, it, we don't think about it. it you're out of there because the, the military has a zero tolerance for hate. Zero tolerance, zero. Uh, can so I just, I'm gonna jump in. Um, me, can I come real quick? So I there was, go ahead, Tori. I was just wondering if you could explain what a jacket is as someone who um, has never served. I'm, I'm sort of imagining like a, a North Face and that's probably incorrect. No, 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 it's not a North Face and it doesn't have a lot of buckles and sleeves on it, no. Um, so a jacket is just a word for a file. Um, we call it, if you've ever seen the movie, Full Metal Jacket, um, that we're not talking about like, I think, uh, civilians probably think <laughs> like this kind of jacket. That's not the type of jacket that we're talking about. It's a file and it's a, every military service member, your file is only unsealed to a certain degree. So the, the, the public only know this much about us, but our superiors and the people who make the decisions as far as our promotions and where we get sent on our duty assignments, they can see all the things in that, in that file. And so that file records all of your accolades as far as weaponry in the military, in the armies particularly, um, we are, uh, we're weapons heavy, right? So bombs is our thing, rockets, you name it. The Navy too, they like, they're like low key, like they're pyro low key low key pyro like but the so there those things like being able to expertly shoot every weapon that would be in that jacket and only superiors see that and it kind of determines like where you go and in the army that's important because you want to you you look we love texas but you really don't want to keep getting sent to fort hood <laughs> you don't Thank you. Um, we'll let uh, Jonathan and Catherine and whoever else wants to jump in now. So um, I experienced it a little bit. Um, I said that I came out to my first commander and everything went very well. Well, I was also trying to do recruiting and uh, by army regulations, I'm required to come out to my commander to start the process of taking medications and everything else. Well, Therefore, I'm in two units. I have to come out to two commanders. I come out to my to one of them. Everything was great. I come out to the other one. Um, he said everything was fine and whatnot. And then that was on a Wednesday. By the following Monday, they have got, They went in. They canceled my orders. And uh, they're trying to say that I'm subpar, that I'm not meeting quotas, that I'm not doing the things that I'm obviously doing. Um, they clear my hand receipts. So all the stuff that I had signed up from that unit, turned that in, went home. Um, and the very same day I got a call from state saying, Hey, we want you to apply for this position, um, and make it my full-time unit. And I'm like, how, how can this be if, you know, if I'm supposedly, you know, subpar and, you know, I called up my, uh, my master sergeant, I'm like, hey, this stinks. Um, I'm going to this board in three days and uh, I'm gonna talk, I wanna use the open door policy, talk to the colonel in charge of recruiting. I talked to him and I'm like, look, I'm not saying that this is what this is, but it looks really, uh, it looks really bad. So um, I was able to stay on for a little bit longer and then they, uh, they went ahead and separated me from that unit. But I'm still, I'm still doing good things. I'm still a medic instructor right now, so I'm not gonna let them hold me back. Yeah, I guess my story is along more along uh, those lines too. It's like, it's sometimes it's just really hard to tell what they're trying to get you for um, or why there's pushback or resistance when you bring something up. So back when I was in my basic officer course at Fort Gordy, um, I just wanted to change our, we have a script for our, what we call the dining ins, which is basically 
um, we all get dressed up in our military uniforms, we bring our dates, and we have a nice dinner together, blah, blah, blah. So um, the script said, hey, you know, um, at this time, seat the ladies, and here's a toast to the ladies. And I was like, well, why don't we make that more inclusive? Why don't we just say, here's a toast to loved ones near or far. Here's a toast to our dates. Because there were also girls in the class who brought their guy, who brought guy dates. So that's like, why would they be treated differently than their male counterparts um, in, in that regard? And um, I brought it up and it was denied. Um, and I thought, okay, well, I'm gonna go see our inspector general um, who's kind of like EO, they handle issues that aren't quite sexual discrimination or they're more command issues. Um, and so I brought up to, I said, okay, well, I'm gonna go see IG. And the first thing that the, uh, it was a major who had de denied it. He was like, okay, well, I'll call ahead because, you know, IG's a really good friend of mine. And from then I was like, all right, well, I guess this is rigged. So, you know, it, it sucked. Uh, that that worked out that way because I, I showed up at IG and they're like this tradition it's always been done like this and I was like okay well not getting anywhere you know and that was the the post IG so I didn't know I was the second lieutenant at the time to to go any higher than the base I I didn't know how to really do that um, and so it's it's little things like that that sometimes pop up. I also had a, an instance when I first came out that I was that I was going to tell the entire unit at formation, and my my captain at the time was like, mm, "Do you really need to do that?" And he actually was like he I'm going to talk to uh, legal, um, and then he basically said, "Yeah, I talked to legal. They there's nothing against doing it, but I don't recommend that you do that. So let's not." And so I was like, "Okay." So you know I decided, okay, I won't do it. Um, I'll just let it filter out. Um, but it's, it's little, it's those things like that, that it's quite, I don't think it's so much homophobia as it's just, just a little, a, it could be, it's just little homophobic instances. That doesn't mean a person is completely bigoted. They're just not opening their aperture to everything that that is. So um, I'm going to step in real quick. I'm going to make this real short. I'm also going to kind of answer the second question because they're really related uh, and I can see them. So um, back when I was at my first unit and I had, you know, those issues where I didn't want to come out. Uh, that was before EO protections were extended to uh, individuals based off of sexual orientation. That didn't happen until 2015. So back in 2011, uh, when I was having those issues and uh, I wanted to do something about it because I don't really like to just take it and move on. Uh, I went to my, it wasn't issues with my commander specifically, but it was with uh, my leadership at the lower level. So I, you know, I went to my commander about it and I was like, hey, sir, you know, I'm having these problems and I don't know who I can trust and I'm not comfortable here. And he was like, okay, well, uh, go to IG, go talk to the inspector general about it. So I was like, okay, you know, maybe I'll get something done. I don't know. I was still very young at the time. So I go to the inspector general's office and I'm like, hey, I'm having these problems at my unit and I don't know what to do. Um, you know, what, what, how, what can I do? What can I get help with? And they were like, well, there's no real regulation on it. There's no protections. Um, and if they're not actually doing anything to you, then there's not really anything we can do. If they don't see that you should go on this deployment or if they don't see that you should be in this position and stuff like that, then there's nothing that we can do. And I was like, well, that's kind of sounds like a cop out, but okay. And, um, that was that. There wasn't really much else that I could do or that I could saw that I could do at the time. Um, so fast forward to 2015 when I arrived to Big Red One, it, that's when everything started to change. And um, to go on to the second question about uh, 
are there disciplinary actions against service members who mistreat their colleagues based on their sexuality? It's like uh, what they were talking about earlier with equal opportunity. Uh, if I had issues, uh, like if someone was uh, using slurs against me or um, you know, denying me access to healthcare or telling me whatever, I can't do this because I'm uh, homosexual or whatever. Um, I could take that and go to the Equal Opportunity Office and have something legally done about it because I have those legal protections. Um, so that should hopefully answer both those questions. Awesome. Uh, so Carla has to step off um, and deal with some life stuff. Uh, so thank you, Carla, um, for stopping by and thank you for your service. Um, so the final question Jesse alluded to was, are there any disciplinary actions against service members who mistreat their colleagues because of this, um, because of their sexuality? I know Carla and Jesse both touched on it, but I want to give everyone a chance um, just to touch on that and then we'll have final thoughts. Yes, the answer is yes. Um, there's always something you can do at, at each level, right? You don't necessarily have to go to EO or IG. Um, for me, if someone brought it up to me that um, they were being uh, unfairly treated, yeah, I might direct them to go to EO. But at the same time, if I if there's enough proof that I that I get, if people were coming and talking to me or something like that, um, you know, I could issue a counseling statement right off the bat that says, hey you will do X, Y, Z, you will steer clear of this service member, you will treat them with respect. If you do not, then there will be other reper repercussions. Um, the EO route and the IG route are definite ways to, to impose harsher um, penalties on a service member. Um, if, you, if you just want some deconfliction, uh, then you would generally just go to the next person in your chain of command, you know, whoever your NCO, your supervisor is, um, your flight, your flight to platoon leadership, um, and you talk to them and see if it can be. So what we like to do in the military is work it out the lowest possible level before it gets to that required investigation level. Um, because we want to give people, some people just, the force, the majority of the force is super young, right? I think um, under 25 is is 60% or something like that. It's a big percentage of the force. And so we're talking about people who are coming from all sorts of backgrounds who might not have had interactions with LGBTQ folks. Um, and so they just don't know how to behave. Um, and so this is a learning opportunity for them. Uh, when I was in my basic officer course, I had a uh, lieutenant who, when I, I didn't really tell them that I was gay um, until I brought my same-sex date to the, to the formal event. And he was like, oh, I thought I was homophobic, but I, I guess I'm really not homophobic. And I'm like, no, nah, you're, you're pretty cool. <laughs> you know, that's just how sometimes it works. You know, like these people might be, they might think that they're homophobic, or they might say things because that's what they grew up with. But then when you sit them down and talk to them and explain or you educate them, then they're like, oh, you know, I am a dick or you know what? I can, I can be a better, I can be a better person. Um, or even just the threat of, of someone with rank saying, you need to treat people with dignity and respect. There's enough for them like, oh, uh, okay, I won't do that again. You know, and that's, that's a, a course correction, but yeah, there are definitely levels of um, punishments that can be inflicted, uh, say inflicted, but administered um, that they, to cover a bunch of different situations. So it's not necessarily always straight to formal investigation and, and kicking the person out. Sometimes it's just starting with, uh, um, a verbal face-to-face -face that says, hey, this isn't acceptable. This is it incongruent with the values of this military.
so each branch of the military has their own a version of EO, Equal Opportunity, or SHARP uh, for sexual harassment, or SAP, SAPR. And uh, just like the VA, it has equal opportunity or equal employment opportunity. So while there's huge regs that dictate everything, the easiest thing to do is to look at the commander's, uh, commander's intent, commander's um, to say that all service members are entitled to dignity and respect and just leave it at that. Um, something I, I should have highlighted on earlier, uh, when you, because a lot of the audience, to my understanding, is probably uh, people, prospective service members or people who are no prospective service members, something along those lines. Uh, as a, a leader of an echelon that is made up of young soldiers, uh, when issues arise between those soldiers or from those soldiers with uh, other leaders and stuff like that, uh, if I had a soldier come to me and say, hey, I'm having this problem, you know, uh, so and so said this to me, or they're treating me this way, or whatever. I would then go to that person with that soldier if they wanted to go, if they felt comfortable, and say, "Hey, this is a problem. This needs to stop. If it doesn't, there's going to be repercussions." And that's the way that we want to deal with those issues, like everyone's been saying, you know. And if you know your leader has your back you can definitely go to them. And if they don't, if the problem is with the leader, that's when you start going to those next levels and saying, I need to take legal action or I need to have an inspector come down and say, there's an issue in this organization. So those, that's how those levels work that everyone's talking about. It's something we like to call in the Air Force progressive discipline. You know, you don't just jump to, to handcuffing them. You know, you, you start at the lowest level of verbals and then maybe a written warning, then a counseling, and then until, if they just don't get it, then, then they get chaptered. Article 15 is what we generally call it, um, which is a legal action. Um, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, are there any final thoughts or comments from y'all? So, uh, final thoughts. Um, the military is not a homogenous population. Um, everywhere you go is probably going to operate a little bit differently, uh, but a majority of the people are decent people. They're there to either get an education, to make a living. Uh, for that selfless service, you know, honor, dignity, peace. Um, so it's not, it's not, a, it's not as scary, I, I think, as some people would, would think it to be. Um, I know that when I told my mom that I was doing ROTC, she cursed me out um, because she was afraid, not because I was a gay man, but because I would be sent to die on the front lines or something. Um, and that just, that's just not the case. Not everyone gets a chance to be in a firefight. Um, there are millions of jobs out there. Know what you're looking for, know what you want. If you don't know what you want, pick something that has a civilian counterpart that, that you're interested in or can just transition to. Um, there is a network of LGBT service members, um, whether you're, uh, and that's formerly known as OutServe, now known as Milan Military Association of America, there's Sparta, um, there's, there's Aver, um, for if you want a, a uh, mentor veteran, uh, which is always useful. Um, even on the officer side, there's a separate organization we call JOPA uh, that we, we add all officers to, that way they can make connections everywhere you go. I mean, legitimately when someone said that we're all over the place, we are around the world, any given base, uh, post, uh, forward operating base, even in uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, those places, we're just, we are a natural part of every organization. Um, there is not a place where we don't have uh, a family member or someone, you know, who, who we could rely on if we needed information. Um, 
Yeah, so it's a, but, and I say it's a big world, but it's also a small world. So you will see people again and again, um, like uh, Danny, I see when I go to San Antonio, I've seen him when I go to San Antonio. I visited Jesse at Fort Riley um, just because I happened to be passing through. Um, I've, man, I've seen, yeah, I've, I've seen people downrange that I was, I didn't work with stateside, but you know, I hung out with them and then all of a sudden they're down there at the same time I have. So it's, it's pretty, it's, um, it's a very big, but small world. Um, what else can I say? Uh, if you're going to be an officer, you know, be ready to learn, especially as a, as a second lieutenant and a first lieutenant, just be a sponge, learn everything that you can, um, and then start figuring out what problems you could affect change on. Um, talk to your NCOs, talk to your soldiers or uh, your junior enlisted, your, um, get to know them, get to know what they do um, and how to better support them. Because that's basically your job as an officer is how do you support your enlisted so that they can accomplish the mission? Um, and so, so that's a big piece, learn that. Um, and then last thing I want to say is a shout out to Jesse. I'm so proud of him for uh, going this officer route. We've talked about it for a long time and I kept pushing him, um, especially when he, when he had some holdups with his package. I'm uh, pretty proud of you, bro. Um, we've come a long way from Georgia. Uh, I would just like to to say the you know thank you for allowing us to be on here and uh, to speak our truth uh, to to a group of people that we normally wouldn't have been able to speak to. So we uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to kind of go off of a little bit of what Roman said. Like for those of you who want to be in the military, and there's a lot of reservations, especially if you're on campus come find me. Tori has my information, you know, uh, I, I will sit with you until you have all your questions answered, whatever you need. And if I can't answer the question, I'm going to find someone who can. And if you're in the core, absolutely. I'm the new first sergeant of Delta Company. Come find me. I'll be on the quad, you know. Uh, I'm happy to be at Texas A&M. I'm proud to be an Aggie. Uh, and I want to be the change that I wish had existed when I joined the army. I want to make the difference. And uh, if you want to be there and, and help the military become an organization that you want to see uh, queer people be successful and be happy in, then absolutely, I want to be there with you. And uh, if there's anything that I can do, come see me. Uh, and if anyone is interested in getting involved with MMAA or AVER or Sparta or any of those uh, organizations, absolutely, I can connect you with those people. I'm on campus all the time. I live in town, so Aggies, come find me. Um, and as far as Tori, thank you so much for hosting this event, even though we couldn't do it quite the way we wanted to. Um, there were some some changes based off of uh, needs of society, but you know, we we have to find a way to educate and be the advocates that we are, and uh, make America the best place that we can, and make society uh, understand who we are as people, and that we're here, and no matter what changes in the world, nothing's going to get rid of us because we uh, will persevere. Um, so thanks and gig them. From, from a historic perspective, um, there were people fighting for the right to serve uh, for many, many years. Jonathan, I, I knew Frank Kameny and, and placed a wreath with Frank Kameny at the Tomb of the Unknowns quite an honor um and i think when when you when you love something 
And those of us who fought to make this change in the military, we love the military. We didn't want to force the military to, to make a change that would harm it. Uh, we wanted to see the military reflect um, its, its mission to support um, the Constitution of the United States. Uh, so, so all along, um, I like to tell people, we wanted to see the defenders of, of freedom uh, be first and foremost, uh, the representatives of the liberty that they fight to defend. So um, sometimes you have to make sacrifices to create change. I did, a lot of people did. Now we see that change um, having come about. And, and um, to see uh, out major generals um, uh, is, is an amazing, amazing thing. I am so proud of them. And I am so proud of, of Jesse and Jonathan and Kat and everyone else who's, who's still um, out there doing the job. Very, very proud of all of you. Thank you in, in this time of an emergency. Uh, you will all be called upon. Um, and I have no fear that um, you will be able to do the job uh, because you are the very best of, of all of us. And, and I appreciate you being there. Um, well, thank you all um, for your service. Thank you all for being flexible and adjusting um, to this new format. I super appreciate it. Um, and thank you to all of the um, center staff who are part of putting this on. Um, with that, we're going to close and we're going to turn Facebook Live off.